You're listening to Reckless Creatives, a Pipeline Artist's original podcast, where Sadie Dean and Jeannie Villette Bowerman share the candid truth about the challenges and benefits of living life as artists. This is Jeannie Villette Bowerman from Pipeline Artists, and this is, and this is Sadie Dean from Script Magazine. We're just chilling here on this, I don't even know what day is it, Friday? It is Friday. Friday, my brain is fried day. <laughs> totally. So um, we've been sitting here chatting and then we realized, oh, we should probably record this. <laughs> we decided to meet earlier in the morning for my morning, your afternoon, hoping to get this done before it's late. <laughs> And, for, uh, before the sun almost- sets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about um, starting stuff, like starting projects and choosing projects and um, being fearless in what we're doing. Yeah, being excited. Yeah. But before we get to that, we're going to um, play a little game. Oh, God. Again quotes from either Larry David or Fran Leibowitz. I'm going to, um, I feel like, okay, stop. I feel like I'm going to okay. have to start studying for these podcasts. Like, but that would take the fun out of it because yeah. I can guarantee you, I think maybe we should do a drinking game. Like we have to drink when I get something right, because I probably won't. <laughs> Does that count as a fun drinking game? I mean, Mm, we could just drink throughout the whole thing. We could take like, you know, we could continue the drunk histories, writing conversations of Spike Scarberry from our episode two. Just watching him drink that whole thing gave me a migraine. Like I had a hangover (laughs) immediately. Well, I feel like I have a podcast hangover after every episode we do anyway. Yeah, you know, that's true. Um, all right. So first, I'm going to start off with actually, I'll hold that till the end. I'll hold it to the end. Okay, so there's don't forget. I can tell you how many. You're just gonna have to guess. Who, that's a good who idea. Said it. That's a good idea. Because it because I outsmarted you last time. You did. You did. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, <laughs> All right. Having been unpopular in high school is not just cause for book publications. Fran? Yeah. <gasps> I got one right. Oh, wait. Does wow. that mean I have to drink? Okay. Is it early in yeah. the day? Okay. This is tequila. Early in here. I'm not guzzling it. Let's not get crazy. Okay. All right. Um, here's another one. I'm one of the idiots that negotiates after I write. I want to say that's Larry. Although I, stop for a second, don't tell me. But I don't want to say it's Larry just because I said it was Fran, the other one. <laughs> but I do think it's Larry. Is that your final answer? This is my, I'm not phoning a friend. This is my final answer. You don't want to use their lifeline? I don't want to use my lifeline. I don't have any smart enough friends to call for this. Because it would be you and you know the answer. Uh, The answer is Larry. Oh my God, I'm going to be drunk. I was right. Okay, (laughs) hold on. I started this, so. living your best life over here i am woo and this is actually tequila from mexico one of my friends terry bayas brought back for me so thank you terry it's really cute isn't it yes sexy yeah (sighs) although it kind of looks like you're perfume but it looks like i'm oh drinking perfume (laughs) well i wouldn't put it past me (laughs) yeah eventually as i kept writing 
something emerged that was not quite me, but a version of me. You see, I want to say, you know, I think it might be Larry, but I think I'm wrong. Know. It's my final answer, but I think I'm wrong. You're right. Oh my God. God damn it. Okay. So this is, I'm just going to warn you if I'm going to keep drinking this, you can see I'm actually not drinking a whole lot. I'm sipping, but I don't know what that's going to mean for the rest of this conversation. Okay. Just fair warning. Okay. I took a bigger sip. Woo. Okay. Okay. There's two more. You weren't supposed to tell me. Oh, I guess it's okay because I'm already getting them right. So fine. That's fine. Yeah. Contrary to popular opinion, the hustle is not a new dance step. It is an old business procedure. Oh. I just want to say for the record, I was a dancer in college and I also in high school loved doing the hustle. And I guess I kind of just gave away how old I am, which is ancient. Um, that's another discussion, which actually was pretty hot on Twitter this week. Everybody talking about ageism and in our little pipeline writers community. Um, so we'll probably touch on that another day. Um, and I think it's really funny that Matt sort of threw that conversation over to me, the old one. Um, I'm like, really? Like, could you be more obvious about calling me old? Like, <laughs> okay, okay, what was the quote? Okay, um, oh, the hustle. Uh, I think that might be Fran. Is it? You're right. Oh my God, shit. Okay, now I'm not taking as big of a sip as I took last time. This episode is dedicated to Spike Scarberry. Okay, go. <laughs> Wouldn't it be uh, really mean if I was just saying that all your answers were? I... <laughs> oh my god! You know what? Actually, I think I think I would kind of love you a little more if that was the case, because <laughs> that's so wicked. Um, no, you actually got this all right. Um, so the last one is actually a quote that I found um, by one of my favorite authors uh, that kind of, I think, lends itself to our theme of our uh, topic today. And this one is by Oscar Wilde. Uh, Man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. Oh my God, that is so true. Do you know... Um... One of the things that I love doing when I, before this whole Rona thing, and I would fly back and forth to LA all the time, multiple times a year. I love flying because there's this anonymity about it. You sit next to somebody who you're never going to see again. And I might actually start creating like fake business cards <laughs> so that they really can never find me. <laughs> um People will say when they think there's no consequence to saying something, they will tell you their darkest secrets when you're on a cross country flight. It's, and my favorite flight was I would fly from Albany to Las Vegas and then to Vegas to Burbank. And mm -hmm. that was awesome because everybody going to Vegas was all excited. And then on the flight home, they were pretty quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I'm all for that quote. That one's a good one. What do you think about it? Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, <clears throat> in terms of you know, connecting it to writing, I feel like as writers, I think pretty much every writer kind of adds a little bit of themselves to a character or whatever the plot is or, you know, the essence of that story. And I feel like it's the, it's a nice way to kind of get stuff off your chest or off your mind onto the page and these characters that aren't real, but are real to you. 
mm-hmm. um, put in things that are very important to you. If it's, you know, you're trying to get a message across or a theme across, um, you could be a little bit more honest that way. Whereas if you were to talk to someone in person, you're like, no, I'm not going to tell you anything because I'm scared of everything. <laughs> And it also gives you an opportunity to murder those people in your real life who you, <laughs> who you might really want to murder in real life, but you can't because nobody wants to go to jail. Yeah. 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 I'm there. Yeah. yeah. I'm Don't killing them all. No, yeah. I'm not going to go to jail. No, I'm not going to go to jail for somebody I can't stand. I mean, no. yeah. I would, I would, I would go to jail if uh, probably there's only one thing I would go to jail for. And that would be um, if I had to do something to protect my kids or my mother, I would go to jail mm-hmm. for those things. But other than that, yeah. I'm not, if it's somebody yeah. that's just, I hate, I'm not killing them. I'm not going to jail for yeah. anybody. Sorry. <laughs> nope. I some care of it. Nope. 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 So, um, okay. So that's a jail choice. So let's talk about project choices. <laughs> which is also kind of like a jail choice. You know, it is because can we, can I just say, I, I have to just like, I feel like now that I'm a little tipsy, this is like an AA meeting. So I'm just going to go with that theme and do a confession. Hello, my name is Jeannie Bowerman and I really hate starting projects. I hate it. Um, I love, Why? I don't know. I don't know whether it's because it's like daunting because you know, how much there is ahead of you. Like some people, I envy those people who get all excited. I get excited about an idea and I can write a whole bunch of, I do a bunch of like, first thing I do is like a bunch of stream of consciousness writing. That part's fun. And I like, like I'm writing an historical, uh, a narrative biography is probably how I would frame it. Cause it's, um, I can embellish, but it's Mm -hmm. about, a real life person from the 1700s. So I have to do all this research, which is really, really cool. The truth truly is stranger than fiction. Like when you find out stuff that really happened, but so the research part is fun and all that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to like, now I'm done with the research, I have the outline for the book and none of that intimidates me. That part I like, it's, it's the, uh, uh, (laughs) Uh, now I have to start writing it, you know, like, yeah. and I'm used to screenwriting. So I'm transitioning to novel writing. So it's like, okay, I need the voice. I need, I could now, oh, wow. I can crawl in people's heads now. So what's that like? Like, how do I do that? Like how, you know, the point of view is this, I don't want to write it first person. And, but can I do multiple point of views? Like there's so many in novel writing, there's so many choices you have to make before you start. and in screenwriting, everything's the third person. So with your not- novel writing, you find yourself editing yourself more with descriptions because coming from a screenwriting background, it's like, you know, you want more white on the page than black. And I feel like it's the complete opposite with novel writing or you're I, just like, yeah, I can do whatever I want now. I kind of feel like, I, I mean, I wrote, I did write one novel just as sort of already, just as sort of, but I didn't publish it just as like a practice novel, which I think I'm still going to publish, but it's a trilogy. So I want to get all three of them done first. Um, the one that you want Ethan Hawke to star in? No, this one, this one is, <laughs> no, this one, this one is, okay. I'm just going to say it. This one I wrote under a pen name because okay. it's a romance slash erotica. And it was not, I mean, it was because after I'd written like Slavery by Another Name, which was like the super dark, depressing project. Mm-hmm. At the yeah. time when I wrote this one, this novel, my daughter was in college and all of her sorority friends were reading Fifty Shades of Grey. And I thought that was, that book was just, sorry to all the Fifty Shades fans out there. It didn't, I didn't, um, besides the obvious of it not being written well, um, I didn't think it was, I get the whole fetish thing and all that kind of stuff. Who cares? I don't care what people do behind closed doors. Could care less. But I felt like it was sending the more wrong message to, to those younger generation of 
what love is. And I wanted to send the message that the first thing you have to do before you go off into all falling in love and finding a healthy relationship is loving yourself. So yeah, the series is, is love me, love me, not love her, love her, not love him, love him, not like that's like the series. So I did the first book and then I put it down for a long time. And then I, I read it like maybe a year ago and I'm like, holy crap, how did I write this? Like, this is actually good. Like, like, <laughs> and then I'm now I'm like afraid I can't get into that novel writing zone again. And obviously this one is going to have nothing to do with that. But um, what, what I, what I think screenwriters, I really think screenwriters can make an easier transition to novel writing than novel writers can make into screenwriting. And but I think both should try. Like, I don't think, I don't, I don't want to deter a novel writer from trying to write a screenplay. And I say that because in screenwriting, there are 10,000 million quote unquote rules. And, and I know there's also people who say there are no rules, but there are some right. basic rules. Like you can't put down on the page, anything you can't see on the screen, like you can't get into characters' heads, that kind of stuff. Can't write all these like, you know, two pages of description of the scene, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so when we switch over to novel writing, it's very liberating. And so you can now write all this stuff and you can crawl inside somebody's head. And, and but we're also trained to make something a quick read. So I do believe that today's novel reading audience likes that. They like to just keep have to keep flipping the page. We know at the end of a chapter, we have to make them want to turn to the next chapter. We instinctively know that um, mm -hmm. because you have the attention span of Hollywood executives. They get so many scripts in front of them, pretty short. You know, you got to grab them right out of the gate. Um, so I think that it's very liberating. And I think the other way, trying to rein yourself in is probably harder. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested um, in taking a stab at writing a novel, especially for, uh, what is it, NaNoWriMo? Oh, let's do NaNoWriMo together. Yeah, I really want to uh, try that out and see if I can actually pull it off. You know what we should do? We should do like uh, every month or something, um, or every couple months or whatever, a couple times a year, whatever. We should do, okay, so there's NaNoWriMo in November. That's for those listening who don't know what that is, it's um, National Novel Writing Month and you have 30 days to write 50,000 words of, of a novel. I've done it before and the first time I did it, I wrote 50,000 absolutely horrible, dreadful words that I've never looked at again. And- Every dreadful word in the dictionary. You found all 50,000. I just copied and pasted the phone book into the document so I could win. <laughs> and, but the second time I did it, I decided I wanted quality over quantity. So I didn't pay attention to the word count. I just wanted to get my ass in the chair every day and write. And that one ended up being 20,000 really good words, which ended up being the 20,000 first words of that book I was telling you about. So that's what I'm going to do this November. Um, just not focus on the 50,000 words, but just focus on getting words on. And, um, but why I bring this up is because I think it would also be cool because I don't, I'm not a musician, but I did play the bassoon and the flute and the cello when I was little, but that's pretty cool. It is kind of cool. So it might yeah. be fun if we had a little contest of, okay, this month you're going to try to use GarageBand and like make a stupid little song. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. It does. And I, cause I would yeah. love our listeners just like I'm pipeline artists and, and like script magazine working with writer's digest, you know, like I think it's really cool to encourage artists to try all different kinds of things. Like there's you, reckless, be reckless. You yeah. don't limit yourself. Yeah. Yeah, speaking, speaking. it definitely opens you up to like, uh, ooh, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. want to, I just, have... oh, cheers. cheers, 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 clink. Um, yeah, it definitely opens you up in one, like respecting an, another craft, 
because you're like, oh, that is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but you also like, I think it like brings other things to your main thing, right? Like um, songwriting and screenwriting, you know, I, kind of, I think they kind of go hand in hand now um, in terms of like storytelling. But they're totally different forms. Yeah. And they're really very hard, mm-hmm. but uh, respect there. And maybe like, if we try like haiku writing, that might Ooh, act, do you, I that know. might actually help people in crafting a log line. Ooh, a haiku log line. A haiku log line. You know, maybe we should try that. That might, that might get people's attention. <laughs> if, depending on the top five log line haikus, we could give some, uh, of these fancy reckless creative mugs out, Matt. Yeah, but Matt, like we could have people like, you know, submit, submit their little yeah. song, submit their haiku, but they, you can't submit a song if you're already a songwriter and a musician. It has to be like a newbie at it, yeah. right? Yeah, and like a poem yeah. or something. Yeah, haikus are really great. I love them. I am not a poet and I know it. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so that was my confession. I have a hard time starting projects. What about you? Yeah, um, I would say the same. the The research part is a lot of fun. You could definitely get lost in it, um, especially if you don't have that deadline set in place. Um, I have a project that I've been working on since grad school, um, kind of similar to yours. For it's about um, a real person during the Revolutionary War, but she's kind of like an unsung hero. And there's just so much research you can do mm. about that time and what they wore and what they ate and, you know, what was George Washington doing? Oh, let's go see what his wife was doing at the time. Oh, okay, let's go talk to like the French. And, and like, I have books <laughs> on this book. That. I have tabs in my browser just for that project still. And it's been almost 12 years, I think, Yeah. <laughs> since I first started. I wrote one draft. Oh, that's good. I had to because it was for grad school. But um, yeah, starting projects, especially ones that, that like are very exciting to you, can be a problem because you get so lost in it. And you, you can s- never, and you're too afraid to like, actually start like okay fade in where am I going (laughs) because now you just have so much information yeah and I think with this book I've got tons of information because this is a dude who um wrote an essay that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson discovered and it greatly informed the Bill of Rights and our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. So like then that takes me down the founding father rabbit hole and you know like all this stuff and then but I'm actually kind of glad that it's, okay, so everything also, like when you're talking about choosing projects, it's all about timing, like of the market, like what's going on. And even, th- I don't think you should write to the market, but just timing matters, right? So when you start something, it might be this great time for this project, but by the time you finish it, three other yeah. projects like it came out, right? Well, this project I had been beating myself up about not having finished yet. And, um, but then- our political landscape became so crazy. And now people, there's all this debate now with you know big tech censorship and however it is you view it, freedom of speech and, and freedom of press and all that people are, are topics in the news now. And so now I feel like, okay, this is really relevant. So now I know how I want to frame this a little bit and sort of sprinkle in some things in the book about where the origins of all that came from. You know, Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. my procrastination (laughs) might have paid off, you know, I mean, there's something to be said about that. But then you feel like when you're writing the book, you're writing this thing, this historical thing, too, which I think is really cool that we're both. I mean, I meeting the two of us at a bar or something, I would never have said, yeah, these two chicks are good at writing stuff about historical characters. I would be like, 
my father tried yeah. to get me into history when I was a kid and I was like, yeah, well, no, don't think so. But um, now I love it. Yeah. And do you feel like, because it's based on a real person, there's like, I mean, their ancestors are all dead. They're not going to come suing us, but like, do you feel the sort of pressure to like, I, I got to get this right. Like I got to the the time period is what I want to get right especially mm -hmm. down to like I'm on like jargon especially in time periods and I have like a whole book on jargon um like I want them to be speaking in the way that they would actually speak at that time I know a lot of shows will do like modern modern speak like a that show Dickinson which I think is really good and, and I actually just spoke with Lena Smith the the showrunner of that but I like it to be accurate because mm. I think then you're kind of like out um you know like with my character there's so little documentation about her and she's had different names throughout history of you know what they actually called her um so I'm kind of just like making her rise from the ashes and what I think she really did and how she did what she did um but also using that historical context of yeah there was like a really big important war going on at the same time and all these other different storylines taking place that were so important at that time as well that I want to get those right and I don't want anyone to like call me out on on that part of it yeah if that yeah makes, yeah yeah that does make sense because I'm with you like when something is so not in the times it's like it 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 pulls me out of the story See, this is something, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw this out as a suggestion for you. You take this yeah. project and you write this as a book in NaNoWriMo. Interesting. Okay. I'm just throwing I'm food for thought. Food for thought. Doesn't mean you have to do it. You can tell me to go piss off. <laughs> well, I, I have a script I was going to adapt. Uh-huh. Um, because I think it would be better as a book. Yeah. Um, and I have here staring at me daily um but I think that would be an interesting book well pick one pick one of them and then if you like doing the book thing then work on the other one the next time yeah you know challenge accepted. awesome awesome <laughs> and I think it's like and that's the other thing in you know the screenwriting world you have these stories on your hard drive and the spec scripts. I mean, some of them won't work as books. Some of them are definitely movies, you know, but some of them might work as a book. And so think about it, think about adapting it, you know, and, um, and we're going to start having some more publishing related articles up on pipeline artists. Um, uh, so yeah, you should totally do that. And writer's yeah. digest has like a ton of resources on, how to do stuff right. and, and if you know how to structure a screenplay you know how to structure a book I mean it's it's really it's not rocket science there's a lot of similarities between the two things creating interesting characters blah 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 inciting incidents I mean there's so much that's the same you're just putting more words on the page <laughs> you know and sometimes that's easier than putting less words on the page so don't yes. let it intimidate you. Yeah, definitely. So when you're choosing projects, Jeannie, are you, do you have like an idea bank that you go to, or is it like something that you just like think of and you're like, that's the next thing. And then you go and like deep dive research and start outlining and you're off the I, races. I have an idea bank. Like I'll, sometimes I'll email myself ideas. Sometimes I'll, I have a file of all these different ideas thinking, oh, I'm going to go back and do that one next. And then I'll think of something and I'll be like, oh no, I'll do that. Like, it, you know, like it's, cause to me, it's like, if I do go back to the bank of ideas, I look at all of them and say, which one am I most passionate about? Because at different stages of your life, I feel like you could be more passionate about some things than others. And depending on what's going on in the world, in your world, you know, all of that. And so but it all comes down to like being passionate about it. Like if I can't, cause you're going to be sitting with it for a while, you know, whether it's a book or a script, you're sitting with it for a long time. Like it, it takes 
years to get either of them done, unless you're an indie filmmaker and you can write the script and you've got your team and you go shoot it and whatever. But if you're going to try to sell it, or if you're going to try to get your book published, you know, if you're going to self-publish, same thing as indie filmmaking, doesn't take as long, you can go do it, but you should still get a professional editor. You know, there's a lot of um, not so good self-published books out there, and that's not going to do you any good if it's, if you just threw it out there, you know? So I, to me, it's always about, I consider passion more than I consider marketability because if I'm passionate, it'll show on the page and it'll make people keep reading it. I mean, like, you know, I, I always, you know, I'll talk to people about like, when you talk about ideas, like you think of Queen's Gambit, like chess, like who, you know, mm -hmm. who, who would think that you could make chess interesting, but they did, <laughs> you know, they did. right. Right. Yeah. It's very true. Very true. Yeah. How do you pick so, up? Do you keep a file? Well, for I have um, on my phone, in my notes, uh, I just will put down ideas. If I have them, I have like a little notebook that I'll jot ideas down in. Um, and then with my writing partner, we have a live document that we mm. just throw in our ideas and then we'll discuss them and like that's the one we're really excited about like we have one that we're really excited about but we both know that we're gonna get lost in the research part of it which is gonna be really fun we're like realistically we don't have the time to dedicate to that if we want these other things done so like yeah. that's like the like one that we're gonna like tackle maybe next year once a few things are off our, our desk that we're writing right now but um yeah I mean it's just writing projects or ideas or stories that are exciting that you're you know that you're going to be thinking about daily or dreaming about or you know mm -hmm. excited to get back to wherever it is you write to write it um like our running joke right now with my, my writing partner is that we're really um into the show what we do in the shadows mm. and we wrote a special for it and um we've sent it out to a few friends of ours and they're like oh this is great and we're like yeah that was a lot of fun to write so now like we'll like jokingly send like ideas or news articles like what if we took these characters and put in that world and like yeah so we're just gonna keep writing what we do in the shadow specs until they hire us <laughs> we're just that out um because <laughs> characters and voices um you know, I think that's the kind of stuff that you want to get behind is what really excites you. And like you said, you know, what you're passionate about. Yeah. Um, it shows on the page 100%. Yep. And if you're not in it, it's a slog to read. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I'm curious also like our listeners, like how they pick their projects, you know, like, so we have a Twitter account, Reckless Creative, but it's like, has an eight Got to go, got to go look at our podcast page and find us on Twitter or just find like I'm Jeannie VB and Sadie K. Dean and we're linked and our bios has our reckless creative thing, but tweet us and tell us how you come up with a project idea that you want to do. And like, so that like, I'll come up with a project, then I'll decide, is it a book or is it a film? And then decide mm -hmm. which way to go. And, um, and then if it's something that there's always something you need to research for me anyway, like whatever job I want to give my character or whatever, like I try to find like unusual jobs, you know? Um, so like researching that, which would be, which would be a good job. Like even that can take mm -hmm. a while to figure out. I've got this book, I think it's yeah. called like working or something that has like all these odd jobs in it. And so sometimes I'll just open it up and put my finger in it and see what, what that is. Um, yeah. Research. I mean, it, you know, it's like, it's, if you don't have to research, then it's like the outline thing. And then there's that debate of, are you a pantser or are you an outliner and mm -hmm. pantser meaning you don't outline and you just, just go for it. Yeah. I mean, what are you Sadie? I think it depends on the projects. I think I'm a little bit of both. Um, I've really embraced outlining probably in the last five years because it's just been, it's easier once you have it like planned out. 
-hmm. but sometimes I'll just like open up the file and like all right and just kind of vomit on the page that way yeah um I have found also like when I'm coming up with ideas um going to the desert just like where there's like nothing like no distractions or anything um I come up with some of my best ideas that I'm excited about Mm. um and I always bring like a journal with me because I just like I know like I'll bring like a stack of books (laughs) I want to read and then I'll bring my journal like okay and I'll just like start like coming with characters or if I see like a different couple like doing something like okay their argument that's interesting that was a dumb thing that they just argued about but that would be really funny for a short film or something um I did that when I came up with a feature script idea and that got me a lot of attention and yeah I feel like having a space where you could have a peace of mind (laughs) to get Mm -hmm. your ideas less distractions I used to go to I used to hashtag Panera office and I used to go to Panera when my kids were at this high school that I had to drive them to. And, um, and I had a Panera creeper. I had like the stalker guy who was there and I used to tweet about him, but I was tweeting out that I was at a different coffee shop one day and I was tweeting out this whole argument this couple had and people were just like on the edge of their seats, like wanting to know what happened. And I did end up turning that into a short film. Um, And that was fun. And just watching, like, even just for listening to how people talk and, you know, all of that is really interesting. And when you talked about notebooks, one of my little tricks that I just started doing this year, because I have a very complicated life. I have a lot of things that I do beyond work and writing. I volunteer for Mm -hmm. far too many things, which I need to stop doing. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I've discovered is these little black notebooks. You can I got like a pack of 30 of them on and I put little labels on them and every project has its own notebook. And so like we even have a reckless creative notebook where while Sadie and I are like talking, I'll write little notes in it so that it's all, I don't, cause or else I just have a whole bunch of little pieces of paper everywhere. And um, I have a really messy desk. I am not a neat person. I am I don't have Sadie's husband who built her this beautiful desk slash office area and is very organized. I am not organized, unlike him. I am not organized. And I'm I'm reckless and I'm okay with that. I don't want to be organized. I don't care. I call it like organized confusion. Like <laughs> oh, see, I call it my organized chaos because I am not um I'll just say I I got gently nudged out of our shared office. And his peace offering was to build me this beautiful space. You know, he's a smart we, man. Um, and already it's just like somebody just came in and just like took like a box of like books and paper and stuff and just dumped it on the desk. And it's like, yeah, there's a keyboard down there somewhere and a, a mouse and maybe a coaster. Yeah. Or there's some coffee. Yeah. 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 Who cares? I mean, who cares? It's for you. It's for you to create. The other thing I have that was like a game changer for me. um, uh, My writing partner, unknown screenwriter on Twitter, unk screenwriter. We it's, he was always a pantser and I was always an outliner. I like a plan in life Mm -hmm. too. I like a plan. As long as I have a plan, I feel less panicked. He is all about I got an idea, you know, and he just, so it's very hard when you have two people writing together who come at the starting of a project from a completely different place. And we've tried, Mm -hmm. we could do a whole episode on writing partners, but we've tried like very different ways of doing it. Like sometimes I would write something and then he would give me notes. And then sometimes he'd write the first draft and I would give him notes. And sometimes we'd have an idea where we had this one horror idea that, that we haven't finished yet, but I really want to finish it because I think it's really good. And where he'd write five pages and then we have no plan for this. Very, very just broad stroke kind of concept. So he would write five pages and he'd throw it to me. And then I would write the five pages. And I remember that one, one time when I wrote five pages, I created this character and I was like, okay, I had an idea for this character of what I'm gonna do, but I didn't see anything to him. So I put him in there, blah, blah, blah. I send it to him and he's like, oh, this is really great. And so then he starts working on his five pages. And when he sends it back to me, he killed my character. And I was like, God, what am I supposed to do now? I had this whole plan for him. So then it was like, it was so much fun. 
because we would just like try to raise the bar you know for each other like here deal with this woman like see how you're going to handle this problem you know and and then i would come back you know like we'll handle this ha huh? you know it was it's it was really fun but so one of the things we created was like this sort of happy medium of a way to outline that didn't make him feel um like it was cumbersome or limiting I will say right out of the gate, when I outline, it does not mean I stick to the outline. Not yeah. at all. Like there was one script I wrote, I had a 31 page outline. But as I was writing it, these two characters like somehow fell in love with each other. And I did not plan that. But so then I, then I kind of ignore the outline. The outline just sort of, I think, helps me get started. But once I get yeah. started, I don't necessarily stick to it. So I have for those people watching us on YouTube, you'll be able to see, I have this big five foot by, that's all pipeline artist art that I threw up there. Um, but because I'm in between outlining projects, but that five foot by three foot whiteboard that I outline on, and I've discovered the secret for me. Everyone has their own thing. Some people like index cards, some people, you know, don't like to outline. Some people like to outline in final draft or whatever software they're writing in Scrivener or whatever. This mm -hmm. for me, um, it's like painting. I take different color markers, like the protagonist will be one color, the antagonist will be another color, conflicts will be another color, emotional evolution is another color. So that when I look at it and I do the little outlines, no one can read my writing. So I'm never worried somebody's gonna come snap a picture of it. <laughs> I also had to, full disclosure, erase my whole outline on this because we're trying to sell our house. And in the beginning, I just had a big fuck, <laughs> like written right in the middle square, like that moment in Jaws where it's like, we're going to need a bigger boat, you know? And so, yeah, I had to take that. I had to erase the board. Um, but I like I, I, I used to do watercolor and charcoal drawings and stuff like that. So I like the whole artistic feel of it. And then I do take a picture of it in case something gets smudged out or whatever. And then I'll give you one more whiteboard tip. If you leave your markers up there for too long, <laughs> it's really hard to erase them off, but hand sanitizer and a paper towel gets them, gets it completely clean. So there's your tip in case you outlined a project three years ago, even a year ago, you'd be surprised how quickly the marker sticks. And um, so that's yeah. my little tip. That's a good tip. Uh, that's like a, a trade in um, film on the slate. If you accidentally use a, a, an actual, you know, um, I mean, a brain part, permanent marker, ah. there you go, on your slate. Obviously, you can't get it off. You take a, a dry erase marker and outline over it, trace over it, it'll take it off. Ooh, that's cool. Maybe if yeah. hand sanitizer is just one. easier. I wonder, because I wonder if you did it on the whiteboard, if it would do the same thing, but whatever. Um, okay. So yeah, so like I use the whiteboard. I think that's like a really big thing for me. And outlining like the structure itself um I think a lot of people struggle with structure um mm -hmm. we kind of unk is is uh unk used to be a uh writer for hire ghost writer and mm -hmm. um he worked with Roland Jaffe from the Killing Field director of the Killing Field stuff like that so He's just, he knows story really well. He's been doing this for so many years, but he would always write under an NDA, not get writing credit and, you know. Mm -hmm. So it all comes super naturally to him and structure didn't really come that naturally to me until I started working with him and, you know, getting in a groove. But, um, so we just kind of came up with a structure that we like, you know, it's not like, you know, any specific story structure up here by any of the gurus. It's what's intuitive for us. And mm -hmm. I think people should also embrace that, like, you know, break the rules kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, how, what are your thoughts on structure? Because that's a big part of starting a project. It's scary. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. 
there because you there's so many ways you can approach it um especially for um genre pieces too um like i i tried um i tried to write like a, a science fiction thing right and like i had no business doing this but i was like okay i'm gonna give it a stab but there's certain things like elements that you need to add to it and you know in that structure in that world um to make it that thing but also another thing it's like depending on the idea that you're tackling like where in the idea like where in that process are you starting from did you think of the idea of like I had the ending first already decided and my did I already know what was going to happen in the middle or is it just like these two people meet and let's see what happens from there because they met and under these weird circumstances um and that I think also kind of frames out how you tackle it structurally. I'm always amazed at the number of people who know their ending, you know, mm -hmm. ahead of time. I kind of do. I think I kind of know where I'm going, you know, but when I'm starting the outline. But sometimes when I learn the character, the two things that change the most for me are the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. Because where you start. And so I think some people play so much importance on like the beginning, which there it's very important, but it's not important for your first draft. Just write something and you might end up pulling a scene out of the middle and putting that in the beginning. And I do the same thing when I write my articles. I start the article and this was something I learned from um, Douglas Blackman who wrote um, Slavery by Another Name and he was a senior national correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And so when he tells me how to write an article, I'm going to listen. <laughs> You know? So like I was writing an article one time years ago when we were working on the script and I'm like, yeah, I'm struggling with the beginning. I'm like, could you take a look at this? And he goes, no, I'm not going to look at it. He's like, just write the whole article and then go back and you'll know where how to start it. But don't worry about starting it. Like even start the article like a quarter of the way through. And so I think that one of the reasons I like writing articles is because it does still it helps you in all your writing. You're still telling a story in an article, but it's less overwhelming than writing a screenplay or a book. And mm -hmm. um, and so don't get, so I would advise people, and I remind myself of this all the time, and when I start to obsess about the beginning, stop, 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 just keep going and come back. And I also don't go back and edit along the way. I. I might go back and read the scene that I wrote before, before I'm starting the next scene the next day. Oh, here's another tip that I love was like a game changer for me beyond the, the whiteboard was a game changer. And then the other game changer when I'm actually writing is I never, and this goes for either screenplay or novel. I never finish the day at the end of a scene ever. I start the next scene so that when I sit down the next day, the next scene is already started. And then for some reason that helps my brain not be stuck or like, I feel like I'm already in it, like warmed up. I feel like the scene is already warmed up and it's easier to jump in it. That was a big game changer for me. Yeah, I do the same thing. I don't start it. I start, I, I take in my, like I'll beat out the scenes and just lay them out so then I could just go in and just start writing from there. But um, starting, starting the next scene too, is, that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I mean, it's satisfying to finish a scene and say, oh, I finished. I'm going to go like have that cocktail. Um, but um, please don't send me links to AA because I'm really not an alcoholic. I only play one on Twitter. Um, so <laughs> I can't even tell you how many people have done that. It's embarrassing. And actually, when I talked, I did a big interview of Jane Friedman, who used to be the publisher of Writer's Digest. And she's, um, if you are interested in writing books and you are not on janefriedman.com, you're insane. Um, not that I'm judging you, but I think you should go to her site. But she said the same thing because she talks about bourbon a lot. And she said so many people were sending <laughs> her DMs to AA asking her if she had a problem. Um, so <laughs> I know. So Okay, so I've already proclaimed that I like a plan. So one of the other things, um, I think it's really hard sometimes to to write every day. There's, everybody says you got to get your ass in the seat every day, every day, every day, every day. You know, 
I don't know that I, I think that makes writers feel bad when they don't do that. And then it, it's kind of like when you say on Monday, I'm going to start a diet and then you start the diet, you're doing okay for breakfast, for lunch, you have your half a grapefruit with whatever. And then at three o'clock, you're like, I really want that Girl Scout cookie. And you eat the cookie and then you're like, I just blew it. I blew it. So then you eat like the whole sleeve of cookies and then you have to start again the next day. Writing, writers can do that same set of sort of guilt trip on themselves if about sitting in the seat every day. So Jenna Avery, who's mm -hmm. a writing coach, had written an article for Script Magazine years ago about 15 minutes just sit down for 15 minutes at the beginning of the day and write. Because even if you're only looking at your stuff, even if it's just 15 minutes reading what you wrote yesterday or the day before or three weeks ago, it makes your mind continue to think about it throughout the whole day. And when you go for a run, you're writing. When you're walking through the supermarket, you're writing. You know, um, when you're not listening to Reckless Creators podcast, you're writing. Um, that I thought was really, really helpful and liberating. And oftentimes you'll sit down to start for 15 minutes and you will end up writing for two hours because you said to yourself, oh, I'm just going to do this for 15 minutes. Who doesn't have 15 minutes? Sadie's looking around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good routine to have. Um, I definitely don't write every day. Um, and you're probably, I, I, you know, you probably fall into this too, where it's like my day job is writing all day, which I love it. It's great. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like, I do not want to write anymore. Like my eyes hurt, my brain hurts, mm -hmm. even though you really like, like, you know, I'm, you know, daily, I'm inspired daily just by my, yeah. whoever I'm interviewing or, you know, research and stuff. And I'm like, okay, and now I really want to write. And then by the time it's like, okay, now I'm like off the clock, you're just brain dead. But there is something about making that time for yourself mm -hmm. um, and making it important, like that you're important to like have that time to do that. Because I think a lot of people forget to like put themselves first in that yeah. creative process. Yeah, yeah. And I'm at the top of the pandemic where I just couldn't sleep. And so I was up at like five, six in the morning um and I would just write before I clocked in for work mm -hmm. and, um you know it would turn from 15 minutes into two hours and it's like oh shoot I gotta clock in because you just kind of like fall into it and you're just like yeah I'm like actually like pumping out stuff and there's something about like having that clear head first thing in the morning yeah reading the news or thinking about work or other things that you have like that clear train of thought to like focus on your character and what your intention is um so I suggest doing that try try getting up early in the morning yeah document and just have at it whatever it is I know for me okay so I used to have your job so for people who don't know a lot of the like writer's digest most of the team is based on the east coast and I'm on the east coast and Sadie's in LA and so I'd get up and everybody else was already moving yeah. and Slack was going and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't ever feel like I could write in the morning. I felt like I got to get my job done. And then at night I'd be tired, you know, and um, after I take the dog for a long walk and I make dinner and then it's like nine o'clock and, and it's like, oh, I'm tired. I just want to chill. And, um, but now that I'm at Pipeline, most of them we're kind of scattered everywhere, but most of them are on the West coast. So mm -hmm. I get up in the morning and it's quiet and I can get my stuff done. There's a, there's a couple colleagues who I work closely with who are also on the East coast, but we, we are all kind of morning time guarded, you know? And um, so if you can find some sort of job that's in a different time zone than you, it's kind of cool. The, yeah. And I tend to work and stay up late. Like Matt always, I think he thinks I'm a vampire because I'm up all the time. He'll like yeah. send a Slack, he'll send a Slack message and it'll be like one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning for me and I'm responding. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but 
so I end up, so it works out for me. Like if I'm in the mornings doing my thing and then I end up working late and um, that works for me. So it's yeah. like finding that. And then there's some people who like to write at three in the morning. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Or I'm get up. And out sleeping. I'm like, I'd rather be sleeping even though I'm awake. Yeah. I, there's another thing I used to do when I, when I went into an office, I would, um, and some of us actually did this in this office. We would um, write during our lunch break. Mm. I, would bring, I wouldn't bring my actual laptop, but I had like my iPad that had found draft on it. And I would just eat my lunch quickly and then just write for, you know, 30 minutes just to get some, something on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but, you know, just finding five minutes here, 10 minutes, an hour, if you have it, you know. Give yeah, it a that's. Talk. I think um, Zach Guten had told me that and he used to work at Final Draft. So maybe it was like a yeah. Final Draft thing. Right. Yeah. And he was like, just work during your lunch break. It's like, oh, okay. And um, so that's another thing you sh- y'all should tweet us is like how you juggle the day job with your writing schedule. Cause I'm cur- always curious how other people do it. And it might yeah. be um, a way for, for, if you've come up with a really good system, you could help other writers figure out how to do it, you know? Um, Cause we all are a community and we should. Yeah. And use, when you tweet out the stuff, like use the hashtag script chat or the hashtag pipeline writers, or, you know, hashtag stay reckless, which, which Sadie loves and, um, and also tag us so that we can retweet it and share it with other people. Cause I'm very, very curious what people do. The other thing yeah. I do to like get to the end of the first draft of something is sometimes I like to have, this is where the outline is handy for me. Like I'll look at the outline and say, I have X number of scenes that I'm going to write. And so then I'll be like, okay, if I want to finish this in X number of weeks or X number of months, like how many do I have to write a week or how many I have to write a day? Like how, you know, um, and then that, I like a plan in case I have not said that before. See, that's another drinking game. Every time I say I want a plan, I like a plan, go right ahead and drink. You can start oh, the podcast over. You're not drinking. I'm not drinking. Go back, stop and start the podcast over. And every time I say that, <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I, I like a deadline and that's, yeah. That's one of the things that like Sadie and her 12 year project and, <laughs> and me and my, I've been writing this book for too long. I should have had it submitted by now. Um, but deadlines are really good. And I think like the contests are good for creating a deadline or get a, a an accountability partner where you create a deadline with them. Like I think Sadie and I should start creating deadlines for each other, not setting them for each other, but just speaking them out loud to each other so that it's like a, yeah. I'm just going to send you a bunch of calendar invites of like (laughs) deadlines for you. (laughs) Yeah, just share your calendar with me and And then you can edit the, the thing saying, eh, I didn't make the deadline. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll go into the event and like yell at you. Yeah. What are you doing, you slacker? Uh, Shame but to you. Go back to our first episode of this podcast is, you know, be realistic with your deadlines that you put on yourself. Like if you don't meet that contest deadline, don't be angry at yourself that you didn't get your project done in time because life does happen. And if anything, you have an opportunity to try it again the following year. Cause you never yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't, and like, yeah, don't beat yourself up about not reaching those goals. I and mean, we talked about that in the first episode, like all of that kind of stuff. There's um, an article I wrote about something about like setting realistic goals minus the punching bag. I think it was what it was called on script mag. And um where I basically talk about that, you know, I also like, if you go and you look at my script mag articles, you'll see, I really like Uma Thurman and I sometimes feel like I'm a little violent. (laughs) 
that's the that's be, that's the karate yeah. training in me that comes out sometimes. Yeah, that's but, that's. But that I think one of the biggest things I learned about writing from doing karate is the mindset. You know, it's that same disciplined mindset and. And with karate, there's not like getting your black, your first black belt is you think when you first start that that's your goal, just sort of like when you're writing and you first start writing, you think like typing fade out or the end is like your goal. And then you're going to have, everything is going to be great. The world's going to open up and everything's going to be fabulous. You realize when you get your first black belt that you don't know anything, like nothing, like, and people, if you tell people you're a black belt, they think that you can like kill them like beat the shit out of them and kill them. And it's like, that's not how it works. You yeah. know, that means I'm really good at doing my forms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean that I can kill you. Like, <laughs> And yeah. and then every time I got advanced to another degree, like I'm a third degree, and then I got a really bad car accident. So I stopped training. But every time they advanced me, I was like, you can't advance me. Like, I'm, I don't deserve that title. Like, I don't know. I still don't know how to kill somebody. <laughs> and... <laughs> And actually I do know how to kill someone. So don't test me. Um, but, I'm kind of scared now. Well, I, when I fly in the planes, I like sitting in the aisle seat, just in case I have to get out and Ooh. take care, take care of business. Just saying. Cause I start, this is completely off topic, but when we talk about starting projects, okay. Yeah. Why did I start karate? I started it because of September 11th. I thought if my family, if I had been on one of those planes and died on one of those planes, I wanted my family to know I was kicking somebody's ass on my way out, that I was not sitting there crying. I was, I just wanted that. I felt like that would, those people in flight 93 who were kicking ass on their way out, I feel like that must have given their families some at least peace that mm -hmm. they were trying to take control of their destiny, you know? Yeah. And that was why I started. And so- and like in writing, I don't even know why I started writing. <laughs> like, I don't think there was a reason. I think it was just a, I want to do, like, a, you know, want to do it. I don't know that the, I had some sort of calling. Yeah. Interesting. Because you're so good at it. So. So are you, girl. Yeah, sometimes. Um... Actually, if you really want to crawl in my head, and this is not a shameless plug, I'm just saying it. If you really want to crawl in my head, last summer, I compiled a bunch of my Balls of Steel articles into, I was still working at Script Mag and Writer's Digest, and I compiled them into this, the screenwriter's mindset. And when I went up to go back and start looking at articles I had started writing 10 years ago, and looking through, it was like, it was like reading my diary you know, it was like, I was giving writing advice, but I'm very personal in the advice that I give. I talk about my therapy sessions. I like, I mean, I'm like raw and real. And after I got done putting that all together, um, like, I don't know how many of you journal, but like literally my articles are like my journal. Like mm -hmm. I'm reliving my life for 10 years. And, um, and that book just came out this week, as a matter of fact, and yeah. Um, digital guide on it's at the writer store, um, which is pretty cool. But I had to, you know, really re-examining like my career and and thinking, am I practicing what I'm preaching? Am I, you know, am I living the life I'm telling all these other writers to live? And it kind of was a big old kick in my head that I need to stop. Not that I don't love my job. I love, 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 love my job. And I loved working at Script and Writer's Digest too, but I needed to start putting my writing ahead of some other things. And yeah. so it was a really good to the 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 the, the um, process of putting all those articles together really helped me. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I suggest everyone buy a copy. It's not going to break break your bank. <laughs> So it's very good. Um, and I hope um, it, it, you know, I'm sure it's going to definitely inspire and encourage people to keep at it or try it out, try this writing thing out. Um, and I hope, Jenny, that you continue writing also. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get back to writing Balls of Steel articles. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to definitely get back to writing Balls of Steel. But, um, and I think there's even a photo of my therapy file in it. it <laughs> I don't know if that made the editing cut, but I put it in. <laughs> It's a big one, let me tell you, kids. It's a big one. <laughs> so anyway, so that's like, that's, and now I got to tell you, like, I made a very important decision this morning about choosing projects. I'm working mm -hmm. on a, um, a TV pitch with another great writer who, um, uh, and we started brainstorming, like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go with this? You know, because somebody had presented an idea to us. Well, one of these characters, maybe she should be her own movie and, that, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it forced us to sit and say, what do we want for this project? And what do we want for our careers? And mm. so when you think about a project, don't just think about it from that project. Think about where is this going to take me? And because if it's not going to take me anywhere, or if my dream is to do write novels, but now you're talking about writing a movie, I don't really want to do that. And, but I want to do a TV series. So like, you know, like, so, and the, and I figured out a way that the TV series coincides with the books that I want to write. So I can dance in both worlds. doesn't mean the TV series is ever going to get picked up and who cares? It's, you know, I'm having a great time crafting it. I'm learning a lot from her. She's learning from me. Like we're, you know, but then I'm still going to write my novel. So it was, it was very clear because when you write with somebody like the, the, we got to this point, like, are we going to write this movie or are we going to do the TV show and, you know, continue mm -hmm. with that pitch. And we decided we're going to continue with the TV show pitch. But I said to her, if you want to do the movie, you do it because when you write together in a movie, you are, and we'll have a writing partner show, but yeah. you are judged by the work you did with this writer. So yeah. we didn't have any plans on writing any more movies together. So it didn't make sense for either of our careers to write a movie together. So I said to her, if you're passionate about this, go forth, write it. I'll give you notes, whatever, but it's yours, you know? And then, but I'll keep working on the TV pitch and, you know, and it's, I think sometimes you have to be, my attitude is I put the project first. So am I the right person to do this project? Mm -hmm. And even if I came up with, sometimes I have come up with great ideas where I have had a friend in my circle who I thought would do a better job writing it because of their life experience. Mm -hmm. And I called them up and said, if you want to write this idea, knock yourself out. You know, yeah. I, I think it's, you, you put the project first and your ego way down below if you're lucky to have one <laughs> an ego or a project <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah uh yeah that's that's uh interesting that you have that experience today and just in time for this podcast I know it was like fate yeah 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 I, I'm I'm definitely interested in seeing what Twitter and anyone else on social media, wherever else we are, um, how they tackle ideas and move forward and outlining and, and all that. Um, yep. It's very interesting. It's very, 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 very interesting. I have one, only one more thing to say about this subject. Okay. Shocking, I know, but <laughs> I am surprised that I only have one thing to say. Oh, Me too. Okay, so my last thing, and this is also something I learned from my therapist, trust your gut, yes. trust your gut. So like if, if it's a writing project that you just kind of feel heavy when you just think about it, which is what this movie made me feel, it mm -hmm. made me feel heavy. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. And, and so choose projects not to please other people not to it's got to please you because if you're not into it the words are going to suck like it's going to show on the page and same thing with like you know working with somebody like 
Yeah. It's a, it's a marriage. So like, if you decide to do a project with somebody you met on Twitter, like you got to really know who they are and get to know them, have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of zoom calls, you know, and meet them in person if you can. I mean, it's, you do not pick a writing partner just on a whim, you know, it's a serious commitment. Yeah, we definitely will dedicate a whole episode to that. And I actually just wrote an article for Writer's Digest uh, Mm. about um, collaboration. Um, It's so important because, yeah, it's it's a marriage, um, a creative marriage, which is even crazier. Like, just the idea of maybe wanting to write with my husband, I think, is the scariest thing because, like, I don't want to (laughs) argue. I don't want peace. Yeah, Yeah, let's do that. but yeah, you, you have to know their intentions and know your intentions also going into that collaboration process. We should, with, guess, you know? we should have the Wibberleys on one week. Okay. The, and um, cause they're a married couple, you know, wrote national treasure and um, bad boys too, I think. And it, and cause I think it would be interesting to talk about like as a couple, how you do it, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and not want to kill each other and who wins. You yeah. know, yeah, I think it's final say. And they're awesome. They're incredible. So yeah, so um I'm done. The end, fade out. <laughs> that was incredible. Um yes, yeah, so I think like I think maybe if you're up for the challenge, Jeannie, maybe the rest of this month of June, we try to do 15 minute sprints of writing. Any time of that. Any time of the day, just get it done. It could be an existing project or a new idea, something that you've been thinking about and see how much progress we can make on something. I actually would love that because the last like week or so, I've been a little bit depressed because my life, my personal life is insane. So -hmm. when people tell me that they're too busy to do this or do that, I'm like, you have no idea, honey. Like you have no idea. Just ask Matt. (laughs) He thinks I'm crazy. (laughs) And it's just a temporary insanity. It just, it's just everything sort of converged at once and it will pass, yeah. but it's make definitely like towards the end of the month uh, my life will be freer, but it's stressing me out because I feel like I can't write, you know? And so I think if I spend 15 minutes a day in the morning, first thing when I wake up before I do anything else, it'll, it'll make me a happier person the rest of the day. Yeah. And I'm sure people in my world will thank you, Sadie. <laughs> I think it's probably like that sense of having some kind of control over your life for just that brief period of time because everything else is just chaos. So I totally get it. Yeah. So that is your homework, everyone. The rest of this month. Yeah. 15 make, minutes a day. Right. For 15 minutes a day. <laughs> and I'd be curious, like, I would like to then, like, maybe we don't talk about it the rest of the month. We'll just do it. And then have a conversation at the beginning of one of our other podcasts before we interview somebody or whatever, just to be like, did that change your routine? Did it change your level of productivity? You know, mm-hmm. those, we'll do it like it's an experiment. And then mm-hmm. we need to follow the science. Because <laughs> if it works, we got to keep doing it. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I, I that's like one thing I always long for is having a routine, especially for a creative time. Um, but also like creativity hits at the oddest times of the day or night. Um, it's like that with my songwriting too. I'm like, oh, I just had like this idea for a guitar line. And it's like, but I gotta finish writing this article first. And then I can get to that at some point later tonight. But um, yeah. Just uh, seize seize the time of day when you can. Carpe diem. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. don't even know if that's what that means, but okay. It does now. <laughs> it does now. We are taking it to another level. Reckless Creatives is a Pipeline Artist original podcast. Like, subscribe, and follow us on social media at Pipeline Artists. And find more info at pipelineartists.com slash listen. Until next time, stay reckless.